Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is a Mexican Crossing Lines with your hosts, Cindy Gomez Shemp and Duke Gomez Shemp. You're listening to 88.1 FM KPPPLP Fargo Moorhead, where we are adding local color to your airwaves. And tonight, I'm going to be covering Antifa defenders, those who defend Antifa despite their violent tendencies, despite what we've seen recently in the media with journalists like Andy Engo and the, at- the bloody attack on him, and also how the left media has defended those violent attacks. I'm going to show you video from Oscar El Blue Ramirez's report on Antifa activists volunteering with Al Otro Lado at El Chaparral and how they attacked and threatened him. And also his videotaping of how My- Mitchell Verder, one of those involved, also known as El Chavo del Ocho, got arrested. I will share more about Mr. Mitchell Verger's history with Antifa, philosophy, religion, and activist apps. And I'm going to share with you how Evan Duke wasn't just promoting the videos you saw of the violent Salt Lake City, Utah protests, attacking police, comparing them to Klansmen shared by Indigenous, Indigenous Environmental Network staffer Sherry Foytlin. He also was promoting the videos of uh, the Oregon Antifa, excuse me, Portland Antifa, and how they've been involved in attacks, uh, including the one on the journalist Andy, and um, other violent clashes that included activists that were involved in the standoff at Contra Viento y Marea Shelter in Tijuana. But first, I want to share with you a link to the video that was just done by Oscar El Blue Ramirez interviewing Pastor Albert Rivera of the Agape Shelter. In this recent video, he confronted the question uh, to the pastor about the accusations made by River Doherty saying that Pastor Albert Rivera is heavily involved, I think was the word he used, in human trafficking. Pastor Rivera answers the ridiculous accusations made by these activists. And I will share the link with you so that you can go and watch his video response, as well as updates on what are what's going on at his shelter in, um, in Tijuana. Uh, but I want to begin, I want to begin by thanking all of you for following our channel and subscribing (coughs) to our channel and supporting our work. We are still planning that, we are still planning that uh, trip to Tijuana. So if you want to donate to our travel fund for Tijuana, please do so. And, um, Duke, how can folks get a hold of us? Well, you can get a hold of us many ways. And, you know, this is a, a YouTube live uh, video. We are having some problems with Facebook tonight. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. We tried multiple angles and nothing was working. And we decided, well, let's do the YouTube live. We've been talking about doing that. Although I really miss doing the Facebook live. Hopefully it's not something permanent, but it might be a glitch in their thing or they're doing something to us. But there's many ways to get hold of us. And, um, uh, I do appreciate how people have, and uh, you know, there's there's one way you can uh, you know go to Facebook. You know, if we're ever on Facebook ever again, the eighty-eight point one FM Fargo Moorhead, the People's Press Project, or Mexi Dash Can. We have a calling line where you can leave a voice message, seven zero one five six six zero nine one seven. Again, a voice mail that comes to us. We might play it on the air. If you say something that we think that we should carry forward. Seven zero one five six six zero nine one seven. You can also just say whatever you want to us. If you'd rather not speak to us via voicemail, you can also email us, Cindy at kpppfm.com, or me, Duke at kpppfm.com. We also have a Twitter. You can tweet us at media underscore ppp. 
and go to kppfm.com. That's our main website where you can see our shows that we've uploaded. And uh, we put our YouTube, we put them all on YouTube, although tonight's is going to go directly to YouTube. And we're going to reverse it and put it on the Facebook, you know, so we'll kind of reverse engineer it tonight. But go to kppfm.com and uh, go to Mexican Crossing Lines and look for our shows there and look at our other programming. And also you can go to kppfm.com slash donate. And that's where you can support our nonprofit organization that funds the station and funds our work. And we did get a donation from someone, and you know, I won't say who they are, but they, they wrote, wrote a nice little message in here. I hope you get to Mexico soon. Good luck and many blessings. And in the front it says, gracias, thank you, merci, much appreciated, so grateful. We're grateful too, so thank you very much for that. And please support us. Go to kppfm.com slash donate. Any donation you make is to a tax deductible. It's tax deductible because it's going to a nonprofit organization. We're a legitimate nonprofit. We're registered with the IRS. We're registered in the states that we're in. And we are very accountable for the work we do. So please donate and support our work. And thank you to all of you who have. Yes, thank you very much. Um, once again, I apologize for the issues that we were having on Facebook. I don't know what's up with them. Um, when we went to our live stream tab, as you can see, I posted the screen capture on our page along with the link <coughs> to this live stream so people could follow along. The stream button is not available. It just says on the live stream tab, this function is not available. So can't live stream. Anywho, we, I, we know what the purpose of all of that is. It is to drive down the numbers of viewers. So the information, the important information that we want to share with you cannot be seen by a wider audience. But you know what you can do to fix that. Share, share, share. Uh, make sure you share this, get other friends to share it. Let's boost this so that we can overcome the obstacles that Facebook is trying to throw in our way. Shall we? Let's show them we can. So we started off our last show, folks, showing you a very violent protest, unlike anything reporters had seen before in Salt Lake City, Utah, with Border Support Network uh, activist Sherry Foytland, the one that cackled like the Disney witch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to show you a video of, an, of the assault that took place on a photojournalist there. This is part of KUTV's footage. It's a very short clip. And what you'll see is a hand going over the camera of the KUTV reporter as they are assaulted while doing their job. This is right before the photographer gets assaulted and thrown off his bike that I told you about. Here's the clip. There's the hand. And you see that there's an activist trying to stop this reporter. And then this clip stops. It's very short, but it shows that they physically place their hands on the reporter and their equipment to stop them from doing their job that came to us from KUTV. Well, folks, it's not surprising at all to me that Evan Duke was sharing those videos along with Sherry Foytland in solidarity of those protesters out there. Here is his Facebook post sharing the uh, Foytland videos. It's right after that one, Duke. Right after that. Right there. Mm -hmm. And here is uh, Evan K. Duke's post. Solidarity, he says, hashtag solidarity. Still here, Salt Lake City Chamber of Commerce is selling out local brown, brown communities. And he, and he puts the same chant that you heard in the videos, abort the port. Hmm. Hashtag, give us back our babies. Uh, F ICE, F Trump, and protect children. And the image that you see there is one of the videos I showed you from the protest yesterday where they're all dressed as animals and they're dancing around to the marching drums. Hmm. Not surprised at all. 
Folks, I want to talk for a minute about the normalization, especially on the progressive left, of violence. The normalization of defending Antifa and their violent actions. Because as long as these folks manage to label someone part of the right uh, as a Trump supporter, as a mega hat wearer, as a conservative reporter, what have you, they feel that that entitles them to the violence that they have perpetrated on people like Andy and Engo. And also, as well uh, as we saw on Oscar El Blue Ramirez. And even today, we heard that there was a confrontation between River Doherty, one of these activists in Tijuana, and Pastor Albert Rivera. They don't have any qualms with violence, as I showed you from their introductions in the Border Support Network. In fact, they like to brag about their involvement in violent clashes, and I'm going to prove that to you again today. Take a look at this video that portrays what was done to the journalist Andy Endigo. Uh, here is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, correct me if I'm wrong folks, but here is a video, sorry, here's a video clip of the attack. There was a much longer video. Um, there's a couple of them on Periscope that I'll have Nemo share with you from Mr. Andy Ngo's uh, Twitter page. And um, in this shorter video, you can see how they uh, attack him with what they're calling milkshakes. They're throwing these, uh, looks like white liquidy uh, substances on him as well as beating him and punching him. Here is the clip from the independent COUK. As you can see, he was not doing anything. He was literally just walking. I invite you to go and check out the other videos on Periscope. They're longer, but they definitely show that he was literally walking around narrating what he saw before his eyes. Here are some people holding signs. These, This is what the signs say. And then getting assaulted. And even then, Andy remains calm. He says, I've just been assaulted. He points the camera at himself. He relates that the people around him are trying to block his walking, that they're trying to keep him from, uh, from, from doing his job. And he was seriously injured. We're not talking about a simple you know, dousing of liquid. Take a look at some of the serious injuries that he received for yourselves. Can you describe what you see there, Duke? It's pretty bad. Yeah, his uh, left eye has quite a big cut underneath it, and it's quite sullen. His right eye is swollen on his forehead and his left side. There's abrasions. Uh, you know, he looks like he got hit. And on his right side of his face, his ear looks like it had blood coming out of it, and it's red all along his neck. Yeah, it looks pretty brutal. And yet, um, there is a defense of this kind of violence. Let me share with you the statement that Mr. Andy Gomez made about his injuries. This is from his Twitter account. He said, as difficult as this time has been since the June 29th attack in Portland, I am in awe at the outpouring of support from friends, followers, and especially strangers, despite the pain and speaking challenges, I, challenges that I am suffering from, I'm suffering from a brain hemorrhage. I'm forcing myself to not remain silent because the public must become aware of the criminal brutality of this far left militant movement calling itself Antifa. They don't just attack the right. They also seek to destroy liberal 
democracy, and the free press. The original fundraising campaign that Michelle Malkin kindly started for me while I was hospitalized is finished now that it exceeded its goal. Thank you all for standing by me. I will use those funds first for my medical costs and therapies. I am also committed to setting aside a portion of these funds for the legal effort that is now launching. In addition to holding to account those responsible who assaulted me, organized the violence, and helped to facilitate it, there is a much longer legal challenge ahead. Systemic issues of governance and policing stem from the upper echelons of Portland's leadership. Violent anarchy on the streets under this city's failed governance has gone on too long and unchallenged. If you are able, please consider joining me on this legal effort by contributing at the above link or going to publiuslex, publi, P-U-B-L-I-U-S-L-E-X dot com forward slash P-F forward slash just, justice dash four dash Andy dash N-G-O. And, um, I invite you to go to his Twitter account and check out what he had to say about what was done to him. Uh, There's also a very good interview that he did recently where he talks more in depth about his background, about, uh, you know, how he analyzes the way that the left, the progressive left, the Democrats are giving violence like this a pass and how they are justifying doing that. I think it's a very interesting analysis. I'm, I want to dive deeper into that analysis, but I want to get today to why this is so damaging. Uh, briefly, this HuffPo article does a fairly good job of illustrating how the left has failed to acknowledge the violent criminality of Antifa and instead is defending defending it and excusing it. In this article by the HuffPo uh, titled Far Right Extremists Want Blood in Portland's Streets, once again, they got it. And there's a picture, prominent picture of Mr. Engo uh, there, uh, bloodied and covered in what they call the milkshake. It says uh, in the subheader, it's not a surprise that a conservative writer was bloodied in a street brawl in Portland. I guess it's normal there now, dude. I guess. Seeing bloodied conservative or any journalists should be alarming in Portland or elsewhere. But apparently this is being normalized. And HuffPo aren't the only people doing it. I've seen it on CNN. Don Lemon, you know what I'm talking Mm -hmm. about. And I've seen it other places. And it's seriously disturbing to me that people on the progressive left that bring up (coughs) Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and his nonviolent ways of being every single time they can are somehow excusing this kind of violent behavior even when it is attacking uh, journalists. The header goes on to say, Far-right extremists have been freely hosting skirmishes there for years, in Portland, he means. A conservative writer was injured over the weekend at a rally in Portland, Oregon, kicking off a tidal wave of right-wing complaints about violence on the left. But Saturday's violence wasn't an outlier. It was guaranteed. It's been happening on the same streets hosted by the same far-right extremist groups on a regular basis since the election of President Donald Trump. These rallies are specifically organized for the purpose of violence with makeshift weir weaponry, excuse me, and bloodied tearful faces appearing in Portland with regularity over the years. HuffPo has reported on how far-right, far-right extremists who organize these meticulously plan their attacks, their ideological opponents, and then claim victimhood when the dust settles. We saw the same on Saturday when the Proud Boys 
extremist gang hosted yet another one of its street fights in Portland at which they were bound to be injured. This time around, it was a conservative writer, Andy Engo, who has 200,000 Twitter followers and a reactionary publication called Quillet behind him. But Andy, I just want to stop there and say, Andy has been published in a whole slew of publications, not just the quote unquote reactionary publication Quillette or Quillette. And what is his crime that made it uh, an assured thing that he was going to end up beat up and bloodied? Is it the fact that he writes for a reactionary publication according to this author or is it the fact that he has over 200,000 Twitter followers? I'm not sure. But according to him, uh, that is a justification. And it says he was bloodied in the melee by unidentified assailants. What followed was a flood of hand wringing from national news outlets, notice the tone, on both sides of the political aisle. Fox News on Monday was decrying Antifa violence alongside CNN's Jake Tapper, who tweeted over the weekend, Antifa regularly attacks journalists. It's reprehensible. At an instant, the underlying problem that extremist gangs have been have for years been hosting bloody skirmishes in coastal cities like Portland, often with tactics support from local police, was lost amid a, me a media circus of pearl clutching and punditry. Are you catching mm -hmm. how... Uh, this language peppered in pearl clutching, <laughs> punditry, <clears throat> decrying. What do you think of uh, their, the excuses that are being made for these violent attacks by the left Antifa group? Well, you know, for me, it goes way back to Portland. Oregon was the place like, when I was growing up where all, all the people my age and younger were going because it was a cool place to go. They had housing co-ops, they had all this progressive stuff there. So young people just flooded there. I remember going down there and spending time in one of the food, uh, one of the housing co-ops, you know, with a friend who was going to college. And I thought it's really weird because there's these pockets of this so-called progressiveness all over the state. And I noticed as time went on, all the, um, the anarchists from our community, they all went there. You know, they've been breeding this, uh, anarchy lifestyle in that state for a long time so you know when, so when i hear hear this report and i see what's going on there it's, it's been the hotbed of uh, of antifa you know and um i'm not surprised because you know and, and as i got older and i went to oregon i always thought it is really strange they have some strange cities and pockets and yet in the rural areas and all the other places the people are totally different you know and so i thought i thought it was so as this is happening and we're reading this article and we're seeing things are being exposed, it actually makes more sense to me now. Yeah. And, by the way, um, these activists, uh, they also tried to intimidate and attack Oscar El Blue Ramirez in Tijuana, all, going all the way back to when he was first encountering them at the standoff at the Viento y Marea shelter. Um that took place for six days with federal police officers, if you will recall. Here in the video I'm about to share with you, Oscar confronts both River Doherty and the um, Mitchell Vetter, Verder, uh, the man that uh, surrounded his vehicle along with these other activists you'll see in the video, uh, in a threatening fashion and took pictures of his license plates such that they would be able to dox him. And so they, this uh, gentleman was arrested. Mr. Verder was arrested. The first video, you see the police officer questioning him about who Oscar Ramirez is and checking out the videos or the pictures in his phone. Take a look. So just tell me in my face you didn't go to my car and took pictures of my license plate. Right. Can you answer me that question? You went to my car late yesterday and took quick pictures of my license plate? 
Right. Okay, okay, so uh, uh, he's, he's filming us. I don't know who he is. Where is it? I'm a journalist over here. He's yeah. do you took Do you took pictures of my last place is. yesterday? So, uh, yes or no? I don't want to know who he is. Why? But yes. But yes or no? He's filming us. Like, yes or no? Scary. That's scary. Somebody, you are scary somebody going somebody and taking is, pictures of my license plate. I'm right here, people, with the authorities right here. There's, uh, there's over there, River Dorothy. This is all the journalists. They're telling me that, that I cannot film over here. They're crazy. I got more rights than you, man. I got more rights than you. We're not crazy. We're just here observing. Oh, uh, yes, I'm here filming. I'm a journalist over here. Why do you? Why? Why did you go to my car and take pictures? Why? Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. You're not gonna win. You're not gonna win. You're not gonna win. First of all, get the hell out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You love to conclude things that you don't know. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then what? 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 You? Yes, you. Attack me! You went all the way, all the all the way to the back where I, I was parking in my car. Get that out of here with it. You didn't put the film because you know I yes. was wrong. Yes, don't get close to me. You were harassing don't me. Don't get. No, I'm not harassing you. That that you works in the states. Me. That works in the states. That harassment and all that bullshit that you guys play. The victim that works yeah, on the states. That works on the states. You play the victim. You're the victim. What the hell? Get the hell. What, what do you want to do? Like, uh, what do you want to do? What do I want to do? See, oh, that's Ada. That's Ada. This is my car. Right. That's my car. Look. Él tiene una orden aquí de aprehensión. Es no, es un, no, es una tengo la evidencia y tenemos la evidencia. Bueno, es una mentira mi lo que le estás acusando. Mira, no, mira, es y mi pregunta, no, okay. mi, favor, mi derecho, no, mi derecho era preguntarle a él sobre lo que hizo aquí. Y es mi derecho como periodista y mi derecho como mexicano de preguntar qué es lo que están ustedes haciendo aquí. Ok, ustedes díganme, ¿son migrantes aquí ustedes? No, entonces, ¿qué están haciendo aquí? Entonces, ¿qué estás haciendo aquí? No eres mexicana. Oscar, Oscar Ramírez. We're right here. We're right here. No, los derechos de que de los migrantes. She keeps saying that she is observing. She's an observer. Yeah. She doesn't seem to be observing. She seems to be harassing. She seems to be threatening. She seems to be giving out uh, advice to migrants. These folks, we've seen plenty of these folks. They are um, under the guise of being there to make sure that the, the human rights of people are not violated while this guy, the guy that is being arrested, sits there and lies to the officer in front of Oscar. Did you notice the officer mm -hmm. was asking him? And, and Oscar was translating in the background. He said, I'm a reporter. I'm a reporter here. Like he was denying he knew he even knew who he was. He kept saying, I don't know who he is. I don't know him. Then they look at his phone and Oscar goes, that's my car on his phone. Mm -hmm. And then he changes his tune <coughs> right away and says, oh, he was following me. That was scary. As if this guy was scared of Oscar. Did you see his video? Oscar's video the day he confronted him? Right before they followed him to his car and surrounded his car and threatened him, that same guy, Mitchell Verder, got up in his face, like taunting him, threatening him. He says he's scared of Oscar. That's why he went and took those photos. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Mm -hmm. We see right through your BS. We see right through it. Check out this second video where you can see them arguing and just listen. Take a listen to the accusations of River Doherty, what he says. By the way, also notice what he admits because when, when he was originally accused by Albert Rivera, the pastor at the Agape Shelter, of being in the... Uh, Border Support Network activist group that provided drugs 
including methamphetamines to the migrants at his shelter and to the unaccompanied minor, which he ki kidnapped, Carlos. This man threatened our station and said that I wasn't there and I didn't know what I was talking about. Same thing that he says to Oscar Blue in this video. He says, Oscar is the one that accused him of trafficking people and kidnapping a child. No, sir. It was Pastor Rivera. And then later in the video, he acknowledges Pastor Rivera when he says in response to Oscar asking, are you going to keep doing trafficking? He says, if you mean helping people, yes. And then he says, I'm going to keep taking people away from Pastor Rivera specifically. And Oscar says, why? He's a good person. And he said, because he is a major trafficker. That is what River Doherty has said about this pastor accusing him in a live video of being a trafficker. Well, we know River Doherty has something to do with it because he actually did kidnap a child on videotape was caught by Mexican police with the child in his vehicle where the child was recovered from. And in fact, in this video, he admits to knowing the whereabouts of that child. He answers Oscar's repeated questions about what happened to Carlos by saying he is in ICE detention. You would know, River, <laughs> wouldn't you? Because you had something to do with helping him get there. See, these activists, they're so fake. They decry the conditions of the same detention facilities they are filling to capacity with the people like this unaccompanied minor that River Doherty helped kidnap from the Agape shelter. And what is more is the accusations that he makes against Albert Rivera, the pastor at Agape. Take a listen for yourselves. This is the arrest. How's everybody doing, people? We're live right here as I came to the authorities. And this is the authorities right here as they are taking custody of this man that took pictures. And they just opened a video right now. They just opened a video right now of him. Uh, they just opened his phone. And his phone had all the pictures of my car. It had all the pictures of my car. There's River Dorothy over there in the back. There's other journalists that is claiming that they're on the right to be over here. And I'm telling them. Y mientras ella vigencia también, obviamente. Porque yo no sé qué caballero señaló él. Y encontré él. Él, él, There's another one right here. There's another one. Oh, we're here taking pictures. Terrible. No, no, no. They're not doing. You guys are not doing. The, you, the only thing that I'm against is that why are you going to my car and taking pictures on my license plate? I told you guys yesterday. Don't mess with me you like that. You go online and you threaten. All right. All right. I'm not threatening you. No, no. You have. You're people. in the other person's country and I'm threatening you. Yeah. So who has more rights, you or me? It sounds like you keep saying it's you have more yeah, rights. Yes, I have more rights because so I'm in my country. Why so do get you the want hell to out of here. Get why? the hell out of here, man. Why? Really? Don't even, don't even start. No, that's why I'm so don't even start. Don't even start. Don't even start. Shut up. Yeah. Shut so you up. Me. Whenever I ask you a question to say, don't even start. Shut up. Yeah. Well, what, what do you want? What do you want? To, what do you want to argue? I don't want to argue. I want you to stop being such an asshole. What? What asshole? Who do you call an asshole? I'm calling you an asshole. Man, you don't want to get your ass whooped right now. Oh, you want to whoop my ass for calling you an asshole? These are the famous blues. This is the individual people. These are the individuals. This is this is the guy that has been accused of a shelter trafficking a 12 year old kid, Carlos. Do you remember Carlos? Do you remember Carlos? Yeah. Do you remember Carlos? What happened to Carlos? Do you remember Carlos? What happened? He's in ice detention. Yes. Do you remember Carlos? What happened to Carlos? He's in ice detention. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right now. But what happened? Why you were taking him? I wasn't. Why I took you were him taking Carlos? Past yeah. And what? No. And why you were? Why you were taking drugs back to the shelter? That's not true. No, that's not true. We got. No. We got proof of that. Oh, all, yeah, where? All, Show it. All Show the people it. in the shelter that were talking, saying that. Keep talking. But where is it? Uh, what, what the hell? You're right Stand here. here right why here you disappear all of a sudden? Why you disappear all of a sudden anything. and you went back to I've the U.S.? I've been here since. No, hell no. Get the hell out of here, man. Get out of here. This individual right here. 
tough. started running after saying, "Oh, we're not doing anything. I'm just, we're not. You're harassing I us." Wonder what get out of here with that. Get out of here with that. Oh, shut up. Get out of here with look that. Look at Dane Cook right here, the comedian. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Just look at him. No, he goes back right you're here. You're really fucked up. No, you're no. You're the one that is messed up. This is the situation right now, people. As I told you guys, I'm not playing with these people. I'm not playing with them, and they think I'm playing, and I'm not. Sí, hay muchas fotos. Está hablando cosas que no son ciertas. Las pone en Facebook. La compartieron 500, 600 personas diciendo que estoy haciendo algo que es punto y aparte. Aquí hay una una persona que está haciendo algo. Pero para poderlo hacer, entonces yo tengo que ir a la policía y levantar el reporte y digo todo lo que te estoy diciendo y entonces así ya se lo pueden llevar. Okay. Igual, de igual forma, como yo estoy encontrando evidencia. ¿Evidencia de qué? Las fotos. De, 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 de Mira, un delito. ¿Cuánto me lo voy a llevar? En la vía pública. Eso es, ese, es el, ese es el motivo por el cual se va a llevar. Vale. No es un delito, es una sanción administrativa. Vale, por ya, eso, ya. cuando lo vamos a llevar? Allá con el juez es el que va a determinar qué es lo que va a proceder. ¿Y dónde lo van a llevar? Ya, Aquí en la zona ya. norte, calle G vale. Internacional. Gracias. Okay. Just stop taking pictures of other people's cars. No, Just stop doing that. Okay. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. No, I'm right here. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stop. Yes, yeah, so get out of here. Ustedes son migrantes? Sí, soy migrante. ¿Eres migrante? Migrante. ¿De dónde eres? De dónde? De Gran Colombia. Oh, sí, eres de allá. So, why why you why No, no, voy a pensar. No, no vivo allá. ¿Tienes pasaporte para ir veniendo? Sí, tengo pasaporte, claro. Pero es que Pero qué importa, es como es ilegal estar aquí sin ser migrante. ¿Por qué andan aquí los migrantes? Están haciendo un proceso para sacar los papeles. Yes, get out of here. Yes. Yes. As you see him right here, people. You see him right here. We're live. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that is. That's what it is. Yep. Yes. So, so what, what, what is your explanation about Carlos? What is your explanation about Carlos? What is your explanation about Carlos? What is your explanation? I already explained. Not yes, but what, 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 what happened? What happened? Tell me. Why would you know? Yeah, but what happened? It's public information. No, it's You're not a reporter, public. right? Yeah, yeah, but you just, I'm, I'm going to the source. You're the source. I just want to know what happened to Carlos when you were trying to traffic him to the United States. What happened to him? It's already been dealt with. Yeah? yeah. Are you going to do it again, River? Help people? Yes. No. I will. No, no, no. Get no. them away yeah, from yeah. the pastor? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, why the pastor? The pastor's a good man. <laughs> the pastor's a great man. Yeah. He's highly involved in No. No, hell no. Yeah. He's not highly involved. You're the one that is highly involved. No. You're the one. Where's no. the proof? Yeah, where's Where the proof? Who you oh, were okay. taking? I mean, you were taking a minor. You were taking a minor, River. No, I was returning. You don't no, know shit no, about I, the situation. No, I know, I know. And, you, and then you took him, and then you took him yeah. back, and then you took him to another parking spot, and they went over there, and they tried to get you, get the kid out of you. Yeah, you saw the video, right? I know. Okay, I, you I, weren't there though. You saw the video. Oh now you're God, talking no. about no. it. No. So. Okay. You, all right. All you right. definitely know what's going River, on, River. You know, do things right over here in my I country. Have done. I've been do here things since right. You guys need to do things right over here. You guys need to do things right. Okay. I'm not causing a scene. I'm just. Come back and you feed people. Or you help people and I, you can, I've been you feeding people. I've been feeding people. Yeah, where? And I've been, when? I, now? Right there in the canal and to my Mexican and Mexican deported people. Okay. I've been feeding those Good. people. We'll and I've been that. helping people. Spend more time. Yeah, no, that, I've, I've, I've been helping that. Time. I've been helping. No, this more. is a waste of time of you. This is a waste of time of you guys. This is a waste of time. You guys got no rights over here. You want a Pepsi? No, yeah. get the hell out. Okay, I just want to address some of the things that happened in that video, mm -hmm. this longer video. First of all, the woman with them is saying to the officer that, you know, he's uh, taking videos, he's making videos, he's, she's referring to his live streams, his reports, 
from El Chaparral, in which he, sa- he accuses us of doing things we're not doing. And of course, as you know, what she's referring to is the accusations by Pastor Rivera that Mr. Doherty was involved in kidnapping a minor from his shelter, among other things. But she asserts that those things aren't true. So because the accusations were made and because uh, Oscar, among many other reporters in Mexico, repeated the same information, which the pastor provided video and documented evidence for, which he went and filed a police report for, right? That's why this woman thinks that she is entitled to, along with these two activists, Mitchell Vetterer, Verder, and uh, also uh, River Doherty, to circle Oscar's car and take pictures of his license plates and threaten him. And, she's, and he, he corrects her, the officer corrects her and says, what you're saying about your accusations that he's doing something to you, that's a separate issue. And then she quickly rattles off, oh, okay, so if I want to make those accusations, I need to go to the police station and make a report against him and then you'll take him away. And he says, I'm taking this guy today for this. And they're like, why? Is it illegal to take pictures? It's illegal to harass people. You did more than take pictures and you know it. Just like you did more than take pictures and witness the day that you went and spit, spat, on Roger Ogden of Patriot Fire and then broke a board on his body and then broke his camera and damaged his vehicle. They're doing a lot more than just witnessing and passing out their crappy little things of oatmeal. God knows what's in that oatmeal. God knows what what they're passing out in those uh, bottles, like the one that they tried to give Oscar. So, I just want to uh, also say that um, when he challenged River, he responded, River responded with, where's the proof? Where's the proof? Well, uh, if the videos of the pastor on multiple news outlets in Mexico weren't enough or the follow-up report that I did showing you all of the evidence weren't enough, Here's some reminders of what they were accused of in the WhatsApp chat that River was also part of and what was said by the activists working alongside River in the Border Support Network, then referred to by the pastor as the Caravan Support Network, although I think he got a couple of his letters mixed up here. Let's show the uh, comment by the pastor first. He says, The problem, the persons that took the boy, this organization is giving marijuana to Agape Shelter. The boy identified four migrants and pointed directly to their face saying, you and you and you are smoking drugs here in Agape. Plus, this group has an addiction problem, sharing and smoking with immigrants plus smoking marijuana with the person that told the boy, I can kill you. If you recall, the uh, child that was kidnapped by River Doherty was threatened by the migrants that he accused of bringing the drugs in and using the drugs at the Agape shelter um, of of being killed. And then the pastor goes on, this group raised money pro-immigrant then and the boy state, how is so smoking marijuana? I, that was, I don't know. There's a typo there somewhere. Um, it is not to the interest of this activist group that the boy would expose this group, which is called Caravan Network Support, CNS, he put it, uh, stating that they are bringing inside agape. So what the pastor there is referring to is the fact that the same activists that provided drugs to the immigrants, many of whom have a drug addiction, including methamphetamine and marijuana, as he said to numerous 
media outlets in Mexico, in Baja, California. In addition to that, they were, they were fundraising off of the shelter for Agape Shelter. Pastor Rivera says he never got any of that money. And here is some of the comments by others in the WhatsApp chat. These are River Doherty's colleagues. Someone responds to a statement by Leti G, one of the activists defending uh, the actions of River Doherty and the others who were with him that helped to kidnap this child. And I'll show you some of the things that she was saying here in a moment. But someone responds to what she said saying, at Leti G, the boy was under Alberto's responsibility and no one, even less American activists, should have interfered. Perhaps, but all I care about is that the boy being safe regardless of what he may have done. Perhaps, but all, oh, sorry, that's repeated. It says, the point now is we don't know if he is safe while he was before. Then the pastor responds, I gave them till Monday to return the boy and to communicate with Agape. They have no interest in communication with Agape or at least given accountability about the whereabouts of the boy. There were probably so many other ways to take the boy into custody. This is really reckless. Keep us updated, please. And then here is another um, of the WhatsApp chat posts in which a guy named Francisco responds also to Leticia. Leticia's comments defending the activists saying, Leticia was talking like she was part of the activists. I saw the activists causing trouble at the warehouse and getting high at the agape. Here is another one of the activists with River Doherty and his friends accusing them of getting causing trouble at the warehouse and getting high at agape. You wanted proof, River? Here it is. And it's coming from the friends that you are in the Border Support Network with. The post goes on to say, Amadeo, can you remove me for saying this? Oh, sorry, Amadeo, you can remove me for saying this, but maybe Trump sent them to cause chaos and to make the immigrants look bad in the public's eye. I'm a Salvadorian immigrant who crossed all of Mexico and knows very well what it means for someone like Pastor Alberto to offer me a place to stay, to eat, to shower, etc. Honestly, the activists seem weird. They always move around in their cliques and have private meetings, all while keeping to themselves. It just seems off. They go around and tell the immigrants negative things to try and pit them against Pastor Alberto. And another person named Gabriela says, Hey y'all, I heard the boy was seen skating away yesterday, so he's on his own. Not sure what can be done at this point now that the child is on his own. I'm also going to going back to the East Coast, so I'm going to leave this chat. So these folks, um, as you saw, that last uh, post by that woman, Gabriella, was like, they were aware after River um, was stopped and the child was recovered from him and he was taken to uh, Deef, they knew of his whereabouts. Amadeo, who started this group, Amadeo Guggenheim, Rumney. Oh, yeah. That guy, mm -hmm. the Frenchman. <clears throat> he uh, is um, reposting a part of Leti G's comment that everyone was so upset about. And you can see a portion of it there. And then his response. And she was saying, this is so blown out of proportion. Let's suppose the child goes back to Agape. What then? Those activists stayed with the migrants inside Contra Viento y Marea. Well, thanks for letting us know, Leti. I think you did too. Weren't you the one that Pastor Rivera interviewed after you pooped in a bucket? Yeah, I think right. it was. It was. I think it was. <clears throat> anyway, 
um, Amadeo responds to her diatribe saying, in my opinion, as someone who's been with the migrants for 60 days straight, and as an organizer of the Contraviento y Marea community, I had never seen most of those so-called activists before the police showed up at the warehouse. They didn't protect nor help anyone, and they certainly didn't expose anything. That he's referring there that Leti G said that at, at the Contra Viento y Marea standoff with federal police, the activists exposed the mistreatment of the migrants by the police. And this Amadeo is contradicting that, saying they didn't expose anything. Also, he goes on, they certainly, go on to the next one here, they certainly didn't expose, sorry, they, they didn't contribute, also they certainly didn't contribute to finding any solution to the crisis the migrants were facing. I have seen the federal police whose actions you are condemning, but truth is, the commander-in-chief of the federals, federales, has always been always addressed the migrants with a lot of respect, even in the times in a fraternal way. In fact, he is so well respected by a lot of the migrants who see him as an ally. He helped us with a bus to get over 30 people to Agape early on. There was no raid for, from the police, but yes, there was a standoff, which I don't love. However, there was no use of violence, which we can all be grateful for. Anyways, those activists, in my opinion, caused more trouble than anything else. And now they are putting this boy in danger, even if they don't realize it. They are reckless and irresponsible and their help, in quotes, is not welcome at agape. Leti, as I said, this group is for a different kind of help than these people are supposedly offering. Perhaps it's best if you communicate on a different group with them if your views are so different. Hmm. Was that the last one? Yep. There you go, folks. There's your proof, River. Even the people that were there said you didn't do jack squat but cause problems and get high with the migrants at the shelter. There are witnesses among your own people that are calling you out in writing. <coughs> and they seem to be siding with the pastor, not with you. In this article, in the Sol de Tijuana, we see that the uh, activists, one of which was featured in this film by Oscar El Blue Ramirez, Mr. Mitchell Verder, is um, alleging that the practices of the Mexican government of having people, you know, have their names, numbers called and having a book that they write their numbers in and their names in is illegal. And um, that he created a page or that they, they created a page where you can go and find out what, when your name, number is going to be called without having to go to El Chaparral. And there's a picture of him passing out his crappy oats. He's wearing a t-shirt, if you'll notice, a white t-shirt that says extranjeros, meaning foreigner. It's written by Karina Torres. It's in Spanish. I will share the link along with this program so you can go check it out for yourself. But it says that the dynamics at the daily dynamics for those who attend El Chaparral to know whether their number is being called so that they could go into the United States and request asylum has changed. The conglomeration of families that day by day await their spot to be called um, has become uh, groups of small, uh, small groups of people that can now just go onto a web page and check to see where they are on the list. And um, within this article, uh, right under that picture you're showing right now, Duke, 
it says keep going the information can be reviewed on a page registered as the number on the list created by Mitchell Verder a United States activists that is with a group of North American citizens who attend the Garita, the Port of Entry, El Chaparral, every morning to hand out free oats and to play a little music for the families and their kids who are waiting to enter the United States or to see immigration official, officials. And then um, he is quoted, or an, a Salvadorian is quoted as saying that it's easier for them to check up on where they are on the list. So um, also quoted in this article is, Soraya Vasquez, director of Families Belong Together Mexico. I guess this is the Mexico arm. It was down there, right there. Uh, the Mexican arm of Families Belong Together by Paola, ac Chilean actress Paola Mendoza, who works, of course, hand in glove with Al Otro Lado, who works with Minority Humanitarian Foundation and others. And... Uh, having identified Mr. Verter's, Verter's name, I went to check out uh, his resume. Here's his resume. Um, check, check, check this out. It says that he is a software engineer. Dude, this is very interesting because it says that he went to school for a BA, BS in psychology and religion from Brown University from the 90s to 1990 to 1995, right? Then it says that he got a BS in computer science from Cooney City College from January of 2012 to December of 2013. Is that enough time to get a BS? Uh, usually not, one year. That sounds like it's a little fishy, doesn't mm -hmm, it? Mm -hmm. And if you look down on his resume, if you scroll down to 2010-ish, you'll notice, you know, it goes down doing a, a bunch of different uh, development programs, etc. It says that he was a TA professor at University of New York, is that right? Or mm. York University in Toronto and New York from 2007 to 2012. And it also says that he authored a book, co-authored a book, Dreams of Freedom, a Ricardo Flores Magón reader, uh, as well as authored a historical review. Okay, <laughs> so let's check out his LinkedIn. Here is his LinkedIn. It also says he's a software engineer. Take a look down all the way at the bottom so you can see. It says he's a software engineer, and then it says he's uh, a software engineer there in Greater New York, that he worked at NextGen Vest helping low-income students to find scholarships and loans to attend college. That's a weird thing for a software engineer to do. Then yeah. he's got McGraw-Hill from 2015 to December of 2016. All of these jobs, all these stints are very short-lived. Seems to me this guy can't keep a job. Keep going down. He worked at Novantis as a developer for nine months, mm -hmm. then a software engineer at Curio Motion for one year, product product manager for one year and two months. Does this guy got anything on his resume that lasts <laughs> longer than a year <clears throat> or two? Short cycles, that should be the name of his whole resume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
two years, five months, Inco system, one year. Uh, I don't know how he did that. I don't know how he managed to have such a huge hole in his, in his uh, work history that goes from like 2010 to 20. What, what, what happened to him? Where'd he go? I don't know. And keep scrolling. Says that he is professional in speaking Spanish and French. And he's worked on these projects. Linux from scratch, Parallel Text, First Row Movies 2012. Then he's got the publication that I just told you about. And that's it. Here's his Twitter account. What was he doing for all those years that he has nothing on his resume? There's nothing showing up. Well, that's okay because he only had about three tweets. <laughs> so it's not that important. He hadn't tweeted for a very long time. Here's his YouTube. Maybe we can get that one up. Check it out. And then he did this app. Take a look at this app. It's called Gutter Snipe. It's not very sophisticated. Uh, I don't know how many software developers or app developers are out there, but uh, I'll show you the video of this app that he created for activists. Okay. Listen, because you're going to hear Food Not Bombs. That's in Clave Caracol. Check it out. Food Not Bombs is connected to those food, you know, shelters here's his video from youtube all right so um we can uh search for stuff that is shareable which is a category there is food medical shelter food um we have dumpsters uh food pantries who know bombs I'll just go through these dumpster so these are all taken from the freegan uh, dumpster directory and food pantries uh, this is taken from the New York list who know bombs uh, taken from the Web page, Food Not Bombs web page. Medical, uh, we have free clinics. Uh, STD testing. Needle exchanges. And then uh, shelter, we don't have that much. Uh, we have one occupation, one info shop, one squat. Not much actually in this. I'm not going to drill down. Uh, so the thing here, uh, so let's go back to uh, the pantries. Now we can see all of these pantries in a map. There you go. They're on a map. Click on one. And then we can click here for details. There you go, there's the detail. Um, and then we can view the single one on the map. There you go. Uh, that, that This whole uh, list, the whole toggling between the list and the map, that's gonna be fixed up a little bit. Um, right now it's a little bit clunky. Let's go back to the front page. If you want to add a new shareable, you can use the spreadsheet or the form. The form. There you go. Name, description, address, time. Up to four comments. Spreadsheet. Uh, Same thing. <coughs> and 
then here's the about page. So if you want, you can send an email. There you go. That's my email. And then uh, look at Kropotkin, Conquest of Bread. This app is basically a realization of some of his ideas. And then that is... um, that's gutter snipe right there. Uh, all right, just send me any questions. Thanks, bye. And uh, gutter snipe, aptly named for how crappy its design looks, <laughs> is available on Google Play if you want to uh, get that for whatever reason. Here's the uh, Google Play. Um, offering of this app and you can also check out another app he made this is his video from YouTube about the medical these things go hand in hand notice how they give away a lot of their operation and then the way that they network together with their free clinic and enclave caracol the free food that they have just like they're doing at viento y marea they do gardening, all of the, you know, same kind of progressive Antifa hippie crap that they do here in the U.S., <laughs> but they're trying to recreate it in Mexico. Here's his clinic or his medical, his street medic app that he created. Okay, action medical app. First, you have to go to the Play Store. You have to install it. Action Medical, there it is. Uh, it's already installed, so. And then basically all we have here is, I mean, it's really primitive at this point. It's just the notes from the lectures. Uh, so click on this one. There you go. More notes. Um, soft tissue injury. It's about it, ad infinitum, uh, just kind of reminder notes for the various um, uh, aspects of the training. Uh, this is a very preliminary version. I'm working with uh, Brian about uh, kind of getting this more uh, in line with the current uh, and future documentation and just improving the user interface all over. Anyways, this is just the preliminary step. Thanks. Bye. Uh, somebody on our live chat mentioned that it's funny that that Clash Singer's video is being used in conjunction with these Antifa people because he hates Antifa. Oh, really? But you know, that isn't strange at all. In fact, it doesn't surprise me because these tone deaf and ignorant Antifa people uh, proclaim that their proximity to idols such as that singer and also other folks uh, like uh, Ricardo Flores Magón, who they who this guy that got arrested claims is Antifa. I'm not joking. This is a talk that Mr. Verder went to give in, get this, Istanbul, Turkey. Yep. And here is the translated version of this event. It says, could you read that one, Duke? Interview, Anarchism in the Mexican Revolution, Ricardo Flores Magon. This Saturday, the dreams of freedom, including Ricardo Flores Magon, one of the pris pioneers of the uprisings against the Mexican Revolution, guerrilla movement, and the Zapatistas 
with his ideas and actions symbolized by the slogan, Land and Freedom in the Inball. We will talk about the Mexican Revolution, anarchiz anarchism, Ricardo Flores Magón from the past to present with the narratives of Mitchell Cowan Vetter, one of the authors of the book, Ricardo Flores Magón Reader. Note, simultaneous translation will be provided during Mitchell's presentation. And it was. Here is the video uh, screen capture of this on YouTube. And as you can see, it's in Turkish. And he is standing there. It's dark. I'll show you a clip of this in just a second. There is a simultaneous translation happening of this video in Turkish while he is giving this presentation. And let me just say, you want to know why it bothers these folks like River, like Mitchell Verder, and these uh, Antifa activists from America that are in Mexico, including Nicole Ramos, including Pitaya, Queen, and all of these people. You know why it bothers them so much? Uh, that people like Oscar are calling them out, that Mexicans like me, like Professor Guadalupe Correa Cabrera, are calling out their BS because they think they're the authority on Mexicans. They're calling one of our revolutionary heroes, Ricardo Flores Magón, Antifa. And if that isn't crazy enough, I'm going to show you how delusional these people truly are, how they co-opt and steal and then silence the very people, the very people that these things come from. This comes from my culture. This comes from Oscar's culture, but he thinks he's the authority of it. That's why he needs to shut people like Oscar up. That's why they need to shut people like me up because we are actual Mexicans telling you what time it is and they don't wanna hear it. Listen for a moment to him giving this talk in Istanbul about Ricardo Flores Magón. Um, so my name is Mitchell. I speak Turkish. He speaks Turkish. <laughs> so, um, can I talk about Ricardo Flores Magon? Ricardo Flores Magon, how can I punish us? Yeah, and he's an uh, anarchist, a Mexican anarchist. Mexican uh, anarchist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, we can uh, just uh, it's give me a history. Uh, in order to understand. Uh, Flores Magan, first we need an introduction to Mexican history. Yeah, Magona, uh, yeah. uh, Alright, so uh, 1519, uh, the Spanish conquer Mexico. So, as you heard, he starts off by saying he's going to teach those people about Mexican history and that Ricardo Flores Magón is a Mexican anarchist. Mm -hmm. That's the first I heard. Yeah, really. I'll tell you something. I told Oscar today <laughs> that this guy was lecturing people on Mexican history and what he said about Ricardo Flores Magón. And he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? If Mexicans don't know, it's because this guy is either a moron or a liar or both. But you know what else they are? And they have this profile, Duke. I see it again and again. Yeah. They desperately <clears throat> want to be the authority on things they know very little about, they know nothing about, or they are mediocre at. Mediocre. Mm -hmm. That should be this guy's middle name. 
Mitchell Mediocre Verder. <laughs> because you know what? He didn't author that book. He didn't even co-author it. But he says he did. Check it out right here on another page where he was a listed as a front-end engineer. It says Mitchell Verderer has spent the majority of his engineering career working on education products. I just showed you his LinkedIn. He didn't keep a job for very long anywhere. Mm -hmm. As a graduate from Brown University, he also wrote, says he wrote it, yep. and published a book on the Mexican Revolution from mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. While mm -hmm. he was in Puerto Rico, he published this book on the Mexican Revolution. Wow. Wow. Makes him sound like he's not a joke, right? Mm -hmm. Except that book didn't really get published because it was censored. And here is him posting about how his book was censored. Hmm. <laughs> Author Mitchell Cowenverter. And he writes, censored personal, uh, persons die, ideals are eternal. He complains here bitterly about the fact that the guy that he was, that actually authored this book, uh, parted ways from him. And I won't read the whole thing to you, but you can see there that he talks about um, how this uh, person he was writing the book with ultimately told him, to take a hike. Okay. It <clears throat> says here, they had differences of opinion, first of all. Okay. He says, the Mexican anarchists teach us, las personas mueren, pero los ideales, buen, los ideales buenos son eternos. He, he has a typo even in that sentence. Persons die, but noble ideals are eternal. This romantic notion contains within a profound insight into the limits of personhood and profound awareness of the infinite rege regeneration of hope. In this volume, the first anarchist remembrance of Fl Ricardo Flores Magón, published in the nation of his exile, we must carefully consider how to understand his legacy. In particular, we must guard against the myths that Flores Magón himself always warned about, what <coughs> he, he always warned about, that of Personal, personalismo of identifying the struggle for human liberation with a certain leader. One can point toward the example of the authoritarian, authoritarian revolutionary figure Ernesto Che Guevara as an object lesson in liberation. <coughs> excuse, excuse, excuse me, in the, an object lesson in the perils of the cult of personality. When one identifies a hope with a personal leader, one condemns the struggle for liberation to be something that can be easily represented and repeated, co-opting a revolutionary dream into an icon that capitalism can easily turn into a commodity to sell alcohol or pop or music, or in your case, to raise money off of the suffering of migrants. Anyway, if you can go back to the... Uh, post that you had up for that censored book it says there in the censored selections part as you can see that person he was writing this book with was Chaz Biff Buff Buff hmm. and it says as Chaz himself admits in his dedication, I did most of the work on the volume selecting and organizing the essays contracting prominent Flores Magón scholars such as Benjamin Maldonado, writing the historical overview and compiling the bibliography and chronology and so forth. Chaz delegated himself the role of an editor, giving himself the ultimate authority to censor my work. After reading my introduction preface, Persons Die, Noble Ideals Are Eternal, Chaz sent me a highly abusive letter attacking, among other things, my references to the prophet Amos and to the ethical philosopher Emmanuel Levinas. <coughs> Could you continue, please? I can hardly read this. Rather it's too than small. rather than trying to discuss and reach a compromise about our philosophical and stylistic differences, parenthetical as book collaborators and anarchists are supposed to do, close parenthetical, Chaz made a simple threat. Quote, if you're adamant on this, 
it the, in the end of the pro this is the end of the project because there's no way on earth they'll put my name to this eventually Chaz and I came to an agreement. I would modify the preface to take into account his objections. Furthermore, I would sign the piece myself, thereby absolving him of any responsibility for the ideas expressed therein. With this, I thought the matter would settle. Un was settled. Unfortunately, I under underestimated Chaz's treachery. <coughs> Are you not going to help me? What? I can't see it, sweetie. Oh, okay. Okay, well, I will stop reading that part then and go to something with bigger text. Yeah. But uh, you can see this uh, obviously did not go well for him. And on, you know, the uh, page where the book is published, it says that he's the editor. Here's the Amazon publishing page for this book. And what does it say at the top there under the author and editor? Can you read that part or no? Right up here. Dreams of Freedom, Ricardo Flores, McGowan Reader, paperback, May 1st, 2005. By Ricardo Flores, McGowan, author, Jazz Buffy, editor, Mitchell Crown, Vetter, editor. So he's listed as the editor, mm -hmm. as the editor, which he claims was the job of the other guy. Yep. So there's a lot of uh, what looks like... Um, misunderstandings no, um, lies <laughs> well it looks like there's it looks like the, he can't seem to get things off the ground yep um <clears throat> to look back <clears throat> and find out how he got to puerto rico how he ended up in puerto rico how he ri ended up writing anything about having to do with this book from from puerto rico i found this obituary uh, i believe this belongs to his mother her name was Mona, and it tells us a little bit about his background. In it, you can see. <coughs> Mona me. Schwartz passed away on January 12, 2015, from complications related to Alzheimer's disease. Born Mona Ellen Cowan in Brooklyn, New York, on June 24, 1935, she was a graduate of Midwood High School, Barnard College, and the Harvard Graduate School of Education. After several years teaching in London and Michigan, Mona moved to San German, Puerto Rico in 1966, mm -hmm. where she co-founded an experimental school for elementary and high school students. Moving to Brookline, Massachusetts in 1977, she taught history and social studies at schools in Brookline, Newton, Sharon. In 1984, she switched careers from teaching human resources, eventually forming her own company, MedPlace Associates, which fostered the careers of medical personnel in the Boston area. She retired in 2008. Mona met Scott J. Schwartz, an MIT graduate and computer hardware designer, in 1982. They were married in 1986. She had three sons by her first marriage, Bradford Verter of Williamstown, Massachusetts, and Geoffrey Vetter and Mitchell Vetter, both of New York City. A lifelong long Democrat, Mona was highly active in the League of Women Voters, serving as chairperson of Voter Services and later as president of the Brookline chapter. She took a justifiable pride in her work, compiling voting guides, hosting debates, and monitoring elections. Fluent in both Spanish and English, of oh, Spanish and French, Mona was an avid traveler. She and her husband spent a month each spring traveling in Europe. Her favorite places were Paris, in Italy's Amaphi's coast. Her husband attests that her natural gift for languages and her char charm communicating across cultural divides made each trip an adventure of sheer delight. They spent their winters in Gainesville, Florida. In addition to her husband and her three sons, Mona was survived by her sister, Barbara Cohen of New York City, three stepdaughters and seven grandchildren. A memorial service in Brookline is being planned for the spring. In lieu of flowers, mourners may send a donation to the Alzheimer's Association, 40 Pleasant Street, Watertown, Massachusetts. Well, it looks like somebody actually went to a good school. Yeah. She went to Harvard Graduate School. Mm -hmm. And she met her sweetheart at MIT. Looks like she was very proud of her work and did a good job and kept jobs that lasted for longer than a year. Mm-hmm. But it is clear here that she did go to Puerto Rico, the very same place listed as the location 
where he comes from on his uh, uh, one of the places where he was living on his Facebook page. I will share the link to his Facebook page. There's not a whole lot on it. You can go check it out for yourself. I'll put it in the comments here of this program. That is Mr. Uh, it's called Facebook.com forward slash mango dot spango with two E's. Mango with just one. M mango with just one O. Spango with two O's. Mango spango. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't know how proud his mom would be of where he took things in his life. Of what, especially having been a very proud Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, is uh, with a, was it League of Women Voters? Yep, and exactly. Very active. Meanwhile, her son apparently is trying to destroy democracy and free speech. But here's a post, an older one, way back from 2007, where he actually talks about his mother and a friend named Chip that came to visit him, saying Chip with Diason tattooed on his forearm, met my mom on my birthday as I was giving her a tour of the place. Mom brought me a delicious chocolate cake with chocolate frosting. Oh, mom. <laughs> Chip brought me a pink inflatable sex pig as a present. What a sweetie. <laughs> Later, Chip used the bottom quarter room with no windows to install ontology of the closet with uh, another word for penis that starts mm -hmm. with a C yeah. and a word for urine that starts with a P and a word for human sexual <laughs> fluids that starts with a C yeah. and blood. Smeared along shattered rainbow glass. Hmm. Is that their idea of art? I guess. He was going to bring his classmates in to see it, but New England Medical Center pigs blowtorched the door shut and stole Tay Tay's tools. Hmm. In the background are photos taken by, I think, Morgan Anarchy. These are just some uh, of the fun things you can find on this anarchist's page. I guess. But that's not all, folks. He also did a talk in, I don't know if this was in Italy or not, but the, the, the wording on the Facebook page is in Italian about anarchy feminists, anarchists, the anar anarchists turn Mitchell Verder, Cinzia Aruza. And um, here's the screen capture. And you can see he's wearing the very same shirt that is in the article that I just showed you from oh, Tijuana. That's right. That says Extranjero. This is from qu quite some, quite many years ago. That must be a very special shirt. Mm -hmm. Or he, like Al Otro Lado's lawyer and many of these other people like Lolly B, just don't have any other clothes. That's right. 2011, it says down there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not joking. It's an old shirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, here is um, part of something that was uh, listed in his publications or things published about him hmm. that refers to one of his, uh, I don't know, citations in a publication. And this is what it says. And I found this very, very interesting. Bottom paragraph there, it says, in terms of historical figures and their thoughts, there are also well-known thinkers who are not usually identified as religious anarchists. Had you ever heard of such a thing? No, I have not. Most anarchists are anti-religion, aren't mm -hmm. they? And usually. they're usually like... Anything organized. <clears throat> they hate organized anything, mm -hmm. including government. Mm -hmm. But also they're atheists, a lot of them, mm -hmm. in my experience. Okay, so this is very strange, which is why I'm showing it to you. It says, but whose thoughts, some have argued, <clears throat> is closer to anarchis anarchism than typically acknowledged. For instance, Peter Marshall presents William Blake as a forerunner of modern anarchism. Christopher Hobson examines Blake's perceptions. And if you go to the second one, you can finish that thought here. <coughs> Excuse me. 
um, of Jesus and how it informs his anarchist leaning politics. They got to bring Jesus into this. Yeah. And then it says Mitchell Verder discusses Emmanuel Levinas's use of the term anarchy and the extent to which his thought resonates with that of classical anarchists. Hmm. And Richard Davis argues that Soren Kierkegaard's call for indifference to the state makes him a particularly Christian type of anarchists. As to histories of much more recent examples, we are not aware of any scholarship aiming to comprehensively map out today's religious anarchists. The religious anarchist community, however, still appears to be thriving. Religious anarchists so seems particularly vibrant in North America, but significant communities are perceptible in the British Isles, Australia, and the South Pacific, as well as in continental Europe and beyond. Websites such as Jesus Radicals provides a hub and a, res a source of information for religious anarchist networks, as do, of course, social media, online fora, and other online tools and campaigns such as Occupy Faith. Have you heard of Occupy Faith, Duke? No, I have not. Isn't that crazy? Because we've seen all these anarchists involved in Occupy movements. Mm -hmm. Evan Duke started off his page, Occupy Inauguration, Occupy ICE. Now they've all been turned into immigrant-related topic pages, like the Border Support Network. <clears throat> and then now they're even bringing this in. In this uh, anarcho-feminism video um, that he shared in, on YouTube where he's wearing that shirt, he gives a talk about <clears throat> his thoughts on uh, how anarchism started out as feminism. Hmm. I'm not sure what he means, but here you go. They're zooming back from a building. Mitchell, Verter, and Sinsa Arusa. Let's uh, uh, resume our session. Uh, and welcome everyone, uh, friends and followers of uh, anarchism, to this uh, session on uh, anarcho-feminism. I'm very happy to be able to introduce three of our speakers uh, today, whom I will introduced in the order of their appearance on stage. The first one is uh, uh, Mitchell Werther, who is a PhD student, PhD candidate here in the philosophy department and the New School. He works, uh, he's writing his dissertation on uh, anarchism, feminism, and ecology. He is also uh, the editor of Dreams of Freedom and the author of several papers on Levinas, and uh, I understand that he's also interested in, uh, um, in, in um, anarchism and in Kropotkin in particular. Our second speaker is uh, Cinzia Aruza, who is uh, assistant professor of philosophy here at, at the New School um, in the philosophy department. She just uh, joined us uh, this year, and so far we've been very happy with her teaching and research here has an in, enormous, remarkable breath, breath and depth at the same time. I'm not going to make you guys watch that whole thing. I just wanted oh, you to see you. that he was actually <laughs> referred to as the editor of that book the correct ah, way. Okay. You know, interestingly, a lot of these people in these uh, networks, in the Border Support Network, they love to celebrate mediocrity. Maybe it's because they can't find anyone of actual worth to represent them. How is this guy... How is this guy going from place to place all over the world uh, with his shoddy resume and background representing anything? Mm -hmm. Well, it is Antifa, so. Yeah. But, you know, I see the same thing over and over again. We heard that one of the founders and leaders, uh, all the way back going to Standing Rock of veterans connected to Antifa and activists connected to Antifa, 
Evan K. Duke III, was an alcoholic with a, a with a criminal record. That doesn't seem to bother these guys. The more violent, off the rocker, messed up person you are, the better you are for them. This is what was being shared by Evan Duke most recently. And he says, this is why we encourage people to punch Nazis. Make no mistake, Evan K. Duke III is a violent criminal force that wants to encourage people to violence and defends violence. He says, much respect to our comrades in X, uh, hashtag PDX who put himself in harm's way. And then he quotes, F fascists forever. Prior to this video, Justin Indivery rushed up to our protest saying, I'm a fascist. I know what you do. I marched with fascists here last Saturday. I'm a proud white power skinhead. He then pushed comrades and came at them with a knife in this video. They claim that what they quoted him as saying that I'm a fascist, I'm a skinhead stuff all happened off camera. No one caught the part where they claim he said all these things, which is not to say that I believe or disbelieve. Well, I'm not going to lie. I don't believe anything these people say. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they have video of him pulling a knife and acting in a really messed up way. This guy obviously is not okay in the head. Who knows what they did uh, prior to the, the film starting to roll. And again, there's no excuse for him pulling out a knife or making threats. However, however, uh, they were all sharing this and celebrating the idea that you should be violent. And this is Antifa leadership. The video he shared in that post, can you go to the bottom of that post of Evan Dukes? If you go to this post, you can see it's Emily Finch's post of a video. Here's that video. Take a listen. I love war. I love war. Gun, big bitch. I love war. I love war. What's up? Why you running with that? Why you running with that? What's up? What's up, man? Fuck, I'll fuck you up right now. Have a good day. Bye. I'll fuck you up right now, man. Fuck, what's up? I'll fuck you up. I love war, motherfucker. That's what the fuck I thought. You're all a bunch of fucking bitches. Go to another fucking country. We don't care, bro. You have a great voice. Yeah, I just poked all you bitches out. Put your fucking knife. Say something else, bitch. Say something else, bitch. I will stab the fuck out of you, motherfucker. Just go. Don't ever touch me again, motherfucker. You're going after me. I will fuck you up. Go. I will fuck you up. All right. You want to tell me again, motherfucker? Go ahead. Say something else. Say something else, you bitch. Say something else, you bitch. This was a fuck. So, again, this guy is shared all over by Evan Duke, by Portland Antifa. Now, let me tell you, that guy with the backpack that has that, that, you know, he's going back and forth with that, you know, puts his hands on the man with the knife. Uh, that man is part of Portland Antifa. Here is another video of him. This is just a still picture from the same day. You can see those straps on his shoulders or the pink, purpley mm -hmm. ones that you could see in the video before. And this is from Evan Duke's Portland Antifa video that he shared. And you can see that it comes from Evan Duke's page. <clears throat> and he says, truthout.org article. Oh, you, you covered it up now. I can't read it. Truthout.org article. Massive anti-fascist coalition rebuffs the far-right Proud Boys in Portland. And at the bottom of the video, you'll notice that it was posted by him with Whose Streets. In the article I'm about to share with you, it says that, the assault on conservative journal journalist Andy 
Engo that I started out talking to you about at the beginning of the show was an unjustifiable attack and a subsequent controversy spotlights the militant left-wing group Antifa. In that photo, right be behind Andy, you'll see a tall figure with a scarf around their neck. I can't say 100% <laughs> for sure if that there, right there, is Evan Duke the Third, who was indeed part of this whole Portland attack against this journalist. But you know what I can tell you? You know what I can tell you? He admits that he was there. Check out this post that he made. Look at this first. This is a video, part of a video. Let me show you the same side by side. Okay, can you can you leave the other one up, Duke? And then push the image of the video that you have from Oscar El Blue Ramirez's coverage of Evan Duke at Tijuana's Viento y Marea shelter. This is the same scarf you can see him wearing mm -hmm. in the art article in Vox as well as at Viento y Marea. Here's another picture of Evan Duke at Viento y Marea from the side. So you can definitely see that's him mm -hmm. wearing the red shirt and that scarf, the same scarf. And here is a post from that timeline of Rob Wilson, photographer, the one that was in the shelter with the activists that called the... Um, along with Evan Duke, that called Oscar El Blue Ramirez a fascist and said that he was a threat to the American activists inside of the shelter. Posting, the migrants and refugees sit-in was a success. People are currently still holding space in the warehouse. President AMLO arrives in Tijuana tomorrow and fascists are now threatening to march on and attack the warehouse in the morning. I will continue to post on the situation as I have, I have them. Yeah. And then if you scroll down, John Acker posts a picture of Oscar and says, was this one of them? Was one of the, the fascists this guy? Huh. You remember they started calling Oscar a fascist yeah. and saying that he was one of the people that was going to attack. That came from Rob Wilson, this page, and Evan Duke. Is it all coming back now? Mm -hmm. Guess who else was there? This burn victim guy that you see in the background, very tall guy with the glasses, the same guy you just saw in the video promoted by Evan Duke, the same guy in the videos where these violent clashes were taking place with the man with the knife. Here's another picture of him. This one's a little bit better. Same guy that was in Tijuana working with Evan Duke. And finally, here is another picture of him, a much, much better image from a YouTube video featuring Portland Antifa. So they call him the burnt man. Same guy. Okay. Same guy that works with Evan Duke that has been involved in a lot of violent clashes, which is what these people devote their lives to working side by side with Evan Duke. Here's another of the videos about that clash where this man, one of Evan Duke's acolytes, is clashing with this uh, gentleman that uh, was subsequently arrested for uh, pulling out this knife. Here you go. Have a good day. Have a good day. Better image of him. Bing back back cameras. Have a good day. You have a great voice. You recognize that? Yep. Okay, so we have Evan Duke talking about the Portland attack in that Vox article. And here is his commentary. Someone named Greg says, who started it? 
Deb responds, I guess it was the Nazis, and goes on and says, and either way, their heads on spikes will teach a lesson to the rest. A lady named Emily says, Andy, referring to the journalist in the Vox article that I showed you, looks to have a picture, looks like there is a picture of Evan K. Duke, the founder of the Border Sport Network, and she says Andy Engo was yelling and heckling counter protesters to provoke a reaction, and that is his pattern. He filmed while Patriot Prayer broke someone's vertebrae unprovoked, did nothing to intervene or get help. He's trash. He also harassed activists and Twitter from multiple accounts and led the charge to dock dox sex workers last year and evan duke chimes in and says the fash keeps traveling around starting starting beep starting poop it's been going on for years stay home and be a fascist in your own effing community we have no tolerance for the effing nazi roadshow these f's don't even live around here a-holes like this killer this killed Heather Heyer and have connections to all the recent mass shootings in the U.S., the Chorch March, the list goes on. This piece of bleep is a propagandist anti-Muslim who coldly photographed fascist breaking a woman's vertebrae recently, F him and those who shelter him. What do you mean who started it? Hmm. So there he defends that whole thing, right? Yep. Um, and you can see that this was the, this, this whole uh, confrontation between that guy, like the one that Evan Duke appears to have been part of where Andy, the journalist, was attacked, was posted everywhere on Occupy, Occupy Ice PDX. Here's another one on PNW uh youth liberation front and they're just quoting him saying the same thing over and over again say something when i'm walking away and i'll stab you every every one of you emmer at first okay and i just wanted to share with you the uh, video from the portland ice abolish ice on this that shows the guy that confronted he was there. Here's a little bit of that. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Beautiful. I'm going to send to Portland, Oregon. I'm not joined by Levon. I'll wait. We're on tour. We're on the Portland, Oregon tour. I'm Ice Prophet here. We're on the first stop of the day. This is Microsoft. Give them a call and let them know you disapprove 
of them having Stuart Lequist as a client that profits off of separating families. Give them a call. You can also call Bank of the West. Let them know that you want them to sell all their stocks in the private prison industry. And then quit playing administrative agent between any, any lenders and the private prison industry. You can also call Microsoft here and let them know to drop all contracts with ICE. Primarily the ones that include selling products such as facial recognition. Have a good day. Um, they were protesting Microsoft. Is that what they said? Yeah. They're protesting Microsoft. Uh, I mean, a lot of these protests seem almost ridiculous. Keep scrolling down. You'll see it. It's huge. It's giant. So if you just keep scrolling, you'll find it. Uh, maybe it's right there. There you go. There it is. How come? Uh, there it is. See That's it. You want to see that right now? Yep. I would like that. Mm -hmm. Very much so. I wanted to show you an image from the comments of Evan Duke. Is it on there? Yeah. Right now. Is it? There it is. Okay. Thank you. He says, you may have seen the image of the old man who was bloodied during the Portland civil disturbance. People are using this image to say how violent Antifa is. What they aren't showing you is that he was armed and instigating violence. Propaganda at its finest. Mm. Keep scrolling down. And you'll see, he says, somebody named Jim, Jim Winfield responds to him. I agree, but... I've seen videos with Antifa members with batons as well. Uh, beeps are out of hand. Things are out of hand. Beating up journalists and an old man is effing weak and something I can't get behind. These same people complain, I'm, I'm censoring myself here, I'm censoring them, uh, complain about politicians silencing journalists yet attack one simply based on his politics. Cowardly beep. And Evan responds to him saying, I was down there. So here he admits for himself that the Andy attack that I showed you a picture looks like he was right there watching it. He admits in, in his own words, he was there. I was down there. That old man was attacking people with an ASP baton, an ASP baton, no one would have effed with him if he wouldn't have instigated. He tried to drag someone out of the crowd by their neck at one point. Winfield responds to Duke, I saw. And Evan Duke says, as far as Andy goes, he is a piece of beep. I was happy to see him get <clears throat> milkshaked, silly sprayed, and chased out. Apparently, Evan, you were close enough to watch him get beaten yeah. as well. But he says, I didn't put hands on him. That's just me, though. If it were Gibson or any number of other Fs we deal with, I would have. And then he puts the story in. So as you can see, uh, the, these Antifa people and leaders like Evan Duke, they like to tell you they're not into violence but they are. They like to hide the fact that they're very much into violence, enjoy watching it be perpetrated, and promote it even as they tell you they're not about that. Here's another uh, picture of Evan Duke. We can skip that one. Oh, yeah. Here's a picture of Evan Duke with Doug Warren where he's wearing another very similar scarf, which, you know, it seems like he's always wearing yeah. those... The same, same Pattern. exact scarves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, let me share with you that if you don't recall, Evan Duke is the same person that has posted that being Antifa is a form of self-defense. Antifascism 
isn't violence. He wants the propaganda to sink into your brain that it is a form of self-defense hmm. against the state, police, and fascists, huh. as he posted on his own page. And also, let's not forget that there was an article that he claims is has no validity to it, but in this article that was uh, linked here, you can see it's from, what publication is it from, Duke? San Diego Union Tribune, titled yep. Fed mm -hmm. Feds Investigate Alleged Armed Disruption Attempt in the U.S.-Mexico Border in oh, December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It involved Ivan Riebling. Oh, the commando. Cartel connections and weapons purchases. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Mr. Evan Duke. Yep. There's a lot of things these folks have been involved with accused of sticking their noses into places where they're not called and none of it is good so please share this program so we can get the message out about these antifa defenders and their disgusting and violent ways and keep it tuned here on 88.1 for more from a mexican crossing lines with your hosts cindy gomez Shump. And do come as champ. You've been listening to 88.1 FM, KPPP, LP, Fargo, Moorhead, where we are adding local color to your airwaves. Thank you and good night. Good night. <laughs>